brethren. It's a wonderful thing to have had such a beautiful and sweet and fulfilling and rich Feast of Tabernacles. I'm still glowing with it. I'm still vibrating with it. It hasn't left. I'm thankful for that. I mean, yeah, you can see it. You see some of the vibrations. I'm kind of vibrating anyway as it goes. I'm a bouncy kind of guy. But what do you mean amen? <laughs> it's the truth. I got to say amen to that too. And a lot of times as I leave the feast, I guess you just get about the business of, uh, of living afterwards. And, you know, that sweet sense of God's presence that's special there, uh, sadly, it's just not the same. But it's, it's been with me. And I've, I really have enjoyed that. And I, maybe more than most people, a sense of peace is very valuable to me. I spent so long in such turmoil, anxiety, fear, uh, strain, stress, always seeking to perform, to please, to perfect, all of those things. I just worked like crazy. And that's a terrible tempest-tossed kind of a sea. And you can't escape it because it's in your mind, you know. So I feel a lot like what one of the brethren incarcerated there at Tucker Max said is that it's like God reached into my heart and he pulled that stuff out and I had peace. For him, he stopped hearing the shouting in his head. And for, for me, it was just a sense of tranquility, a knowledge that I was loved, that I was precious. My life had purpose and meaning that's so deep and rich. It's like a salve that soothes the wound. Also, that things were okay, you know, that I was in my father's arms and that he would take care of me. And that meant so much to me. So the fact that that sense of peace abides, it's so valuable to me. If you will, turn with me to Judges chapter 6. I want to look at something. We'll start at about verse 11. Now, this story is about Gideon, but it's not just a story. This really happened. This is a real person. God had it recorded for our benefit. And having heard many of the testimonies and spoken personally with a few uh, people, I just believe that there is a lesson here for us to learn. One of the things I saw, and I'll just draw this thread because I find it helpful to prime my mind before I look at a subject. So here's the meta narrative. This is the overarching theme. And that is that uh, Satan, I think, has worked pretty hard to try to prevent us from recognizing who we are and what we're capable of in the Lord. I saw a lot, I heard a lot of testimonies about how Satan was doing basically what you might call a preemptive strike attempting to intimidate, uh, to cower, to push us back. And of course, I uh, don't mean to embarrass you, Brian, but your example, it just springs to my mind immediately. Satan was working long before the feast to try to get Brian to shut up, telling him he's unworthy, you know. And the whole time, this is, if you can get the picture, this is Satan cowering, shaking, because he knows what's coming. He's about to have his kingdom shaken again again, which is humiliating and painful for Satan, something that I enjoy. I'm glad that it is. So here he is, but he's trying to act like he's intimidating, and he's trying to get Brian to buy into that and believe, and in some way diminish what he might do. Brian resists. He fights back, which is what we must do. We resist the devil. That is a fighting word. You know, that's resistance. It's not just like push. I mean, it's fight, destroy, overcome, overwhelm. So he did. In the Lord, he just did it in faith, growing those faith muscles. And I think he must have doubled down. I haven't asked him personally about that, but I imagine there was a little bit more uh, public worship, not just that first night, but it seemed almost spontaneous that you decided to do again. I find that a good way to fight. I know you have. But look what happened. This is what I'm getting to. Look what happened. Captives were set free. Deliverance occurred because he wouldn't be intimidated by the enemy. That's just one example. I mean, it certainly 
uh, has blessed us in this house and helped to serve the body. There are many other examples in the house. That one simply sprang to my mind. But I see here a pattern. I think it's, it's good for us to recognize what God has said and what he's shown us. So here in Judges 6, verse 11, we open. The angel of the Lord had come and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joas, the Abiezrite, as his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. So they were being constantly raided by the Midianites. They were a foreign invader with raiding parties that were just putting God's people under their thumb. They were under attack. That's how it was. And as we open, I mean, we've mentioned it many times before, this is what you see in the natural. You look at Midian, you see a man who is afraid. He sees the enemy in the natural. He understands that the enemy has at will overpowered those people. And he sees himself as one who must hide. He's trying to survive, just to stay undercover. That's how he sees himself. But notice, verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And that always used to make me giggle. I thought maybe it was sarcasm. It's not. No, it's not. Here's something that I want to note. God knew who Gideon was. Get that. God knew. Uh, Gideon didn't know yet. He would come to know. But right now, God is telling him, right, valiant warrior. Now, for us, many of us, we look at ourselves in the flesh, and we don't think, I'm a valiant warrior. I'm an overwhelming conqueror, as we're told in Romans chapter 8. We don't see it. Well, we're half right. In the flesh, we're not. All of those things, that's the evidence. I mean, that's, that's how twisted Satan is. He'll point to these things. You can look at them. But you have a speech impediment. Oh, but you've always been shy. Hey, you forget chapter and verse. Hey, you remember all those sins you committed. You can't stand up on some platform and witness to people now. You're a mess. You were a mess. People will know that. You don't have credibility. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Whatever it is. Those are some factual things in the flesh, but, you know, that's completely irrelevant when it comes to who we are in the Spirit. And who we are in the Spirit is who we are. This flesh, it's going away. Yes, we have to drag it around. It's good for us that we do, in fact. Helps us develop character that will go on for eternity. It is a blessed thing. In the gym of life, Satan is the weights, right? The flesh is a handle that we can grab. It, it helps us to grow and develop. God was wise doing that. But that ain't who you are in the Lord, and he knows he knows who we are. He's right. When there is a fight between how you feel and this garbage that Satan is bringing up, pointing you at it, rubbing your nose in it, you answer that lie with the truth. God is right. Isn't in this example God right? We'll get to the end of it, but we'll see. God was right all along, not the way Gideon saw it. And it's likewise, Satan was wrong about Brian. He wasn't weak or ineffectual or incapable or disqualified or hypocritical. He was strong and mighty and powerful in the Lord and an instrument chosen by him for that time to glorify his name and set captives free and make people whole. That's the truth and that's what we saw borne out. So when the angel says this to him, God's not wrong. And Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, didn't the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Man, what irony. Because does it, do you think that it might strike Gideon that this is a miracle? I mean, do you think that it might occur to him in his mind when he's saying, in the middle of saying, where are the miracles? He's experiencing an angel of the Lord speaking to him directly. Don't you think that might be a clue if he had mulled it over, just mull it, you know? You know, he's going to be part of that miracle. He could not comprehend it at the time. He says, but now the Lord's abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. God had not abandoned him. God was with him. God saw what was happening. In fact, he had prepared Gideon for this hour. Verse 14, the Lord looked at him and he said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. You do it. You go. Now that... 
I'm sure, is blowing Gideon's mind. He says, have I not sent you? We ought to be squared away on that for ourselves. Hasn't God sent us? Hasn't he? Every one of us? Don't we bear his name? Don't we have his banner flying over our lives? Isn't he a consuming fire going before us? Doesn't he strengthen and reside in us? Doesn't he inspire and speak words of life? Doesn't a sword, quick, active, sharp, double-edged, come out of our mouths when we open them? Don't people get healed? Don't people get set free? We've been sent. We have that authority. And God is telling Gideon that. Go in this your strength. Deliver Israel. For us, it's delivering Israel. We're delivering spiritual Israel. That's what we're doing. We're taking them out of the hands and the grip of Satan who hates and torments and causes them pain. That's their life where we all were. Breaking those shackles and chains, shining the light, bringing down the walls and stronghold, and bringing that child home where they can know all that we know and turn around and join with us at war and set other captives free. And everyone is valuable that way. And he said to him, verse 15, Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the least in Manasseh. I'm the youngest in my father's house. Again. He's not wrong in the flesh, but the flesh is really meaningless. It just doesn't matter. Look, God plus anything is mighty. Amen. Look, God plus nothing created everything. Think on that. Think about God plus, you know, a couple of loaves, a few fish, feeding thousands. He doesn't need us to bring anything, but just yieldedness. That's all. Just trust him. Just yield. That's all that he needs. And then we're mighty. We are mighty. There's no power anywhere that can stand against God and any believer at all. Doesn't matter if it's just one of us. One of us delivered into the hands of Satan for an hour to glorify God's name will put them to shame, as Jesus did. Even as blind Bartimaeus did with no training or education at all, he shut up the mouths of the biggest scholars. He made them so mad they didn't have an answer. All they could do is send him away. I mean, the, the weak will confound the wise in God's power. It's wonderful. And I frankly get a kick out of that as well. Verse 16, so the Lord is answering him with the truth. Look at this, Gideon, not that. The Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. You will defeat Midian as one man. Now God's saying, here's the key. Okay, everything you just listed is true. You're the least in your house. You're the youngest. True. That's true. And your house is an unimportant clan here in the town. Yeah. So what? So what? I'm going with you. Who can stand against God Almighty? Any of you wrestling with that, I'll just answer it for you. Nobody. Ain't nobody. Nobody can stand against the living God. That's what he's answering back. That's instructive for us. That's how we answer back. The Lord resides in us. And so he says, Gideon says to him, If I found favor in your sight, please show me a sign that it's you who speak to me. Again, I say the irony is thick. I mean, show me a sign. Oh, you mean other than the fact that an angel of God is appearing to you? I mean, all right then. I mean, God is patient with him. Let's skip on down. I, what I want to get from that, I want to get the fact that God knew who Gideon was, even when he didn't. Let's go to the next chapter, chapter 7, because I want to take note of something else that's also, I believe, instructive for us. We'll skip down to verse 9. This is after God had given Gideon the command, and he was wavering a little bit, wasn't sure if he could trust God yet. So verse 9, God says to him, In the same night it came about, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp. I have given it into your hands. And God's not wrong again. He's using a completed tense. I've already done it. Now go get it. That's exactly how it is with us. The Lord has fought every battle we will face. He's already squared it away. For us, we simply walk faithfully 
into the provision he's already made. And that's with everything. He provides all that we need. He provides healing, forgiveness, strength, power to stand, and every victory. We walk, really, from victory to victory to victory. That's all that's in front of us. Look, that would inform my thinking. If I were a member of a football team and I were really in anxiety over what a big, important game was going to be, if I had somebody, like in Back to the Future, Manny, who could come and tell me, listen, let me tell you what the outcome is. You're about to have the game of your life. You have no idea. These are the stats. It's recorded. This is history for us, but look at what you were able to do. You overwhelmingly conquered. I think that that would have an impact on how I played. Well, that's us. I mean, God's telling him the truth. God's already seen it. He's already done it. He's just telling him to go. And every time that we're sent, that's all in the world that's going on. And let's not be confused, okay? If the enemy does crucify us, skin us alive, torture us to death, those are all victories. As Paul rightly said, in all of these things, we are overwhelming conquerors. That's what the pages of this book are filled with, those faithful ones. And look, in those moments, we don't need to fear at all. The God who had to go through that alone himself, Jesus, now, there was nobody to stand with him, even his father turned his back. He had to fight alone. We never do. We never do. And if my experience is any indicator, man, in those moments, there's a grace. In many ways, those moments are easier than the mundane grind of living. They just are. He's there. He's not going to let you go through it alone. Even in those moments, we will do as the Christians of old as all those faithful ones that have gone before us have done, we will sing God's praises in the midst of it. We will feel his love. It will be a loud, unextinguishable witness for the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good. We don't have to be afraid of it. Those are victories too. Verse 10, God says, But if you are afraid to go down, Go with Pura, your servant, down to the camp, and you will hear what they say. Afterwards, your hands will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. So he went with Pura, his servant, down to the outpost of the army that was in the camp. The point of this is to eavesdrop on the enemy. Now, I have not actually heard this. There are examples in the Bible that I draw from, but I did see it. Wasn't it this feast? It was a feast before. In the spirit, Satan and his forces quivering in terror terrified and I saw us mighty so mighty like Joel too mighty like I didn't send it to everybody but I did send it to Blake because of what he spoke about there's a scene in Lord of the Rings I think it's in the two towers there's a particular stronghold of the good guys that's under attack in front of it there's this steep bank surrounded by mountains and through the night, if you watch the movie, there's a pitched battle. It's dark. It's storming. It's like, it's like the heavens are being rent with this clash between good and evil. And these almost demonic-looking creatures with their battlements are killing and just slaughtering the good guys who are there in the fortress and fighting with all of their might, with many good men having spent everything they had to withstand the attack. But they were told several days earlier, before the battle began, by Gandalf, who is sort of a, a leader, a powerful man. He said, on the third day, look to the east with the rising sun. So in the middle of this pitched battle, when all hope seems lost, one of the main characters convinces the king who's there at the stronghold, listen, maybe we are going to perish. Maybe we are. But let's not do it like cowards. Let's go out and meet our enemy face to face. If we die, we die. Let's die in a valiant effort. You know, gird on your sword one more time, king. Let's ride. Let's go. And so they open the gates, and they're coming out. And just when it seemed that all hope was lost, the sun suddenly just explodes over this mountaintop. And you see there Gandalf. He's on a white steed. And he's holding up the staff of his power. There's an explosion of light and a shout. And suddenly, this whole sea of warriors come crashing down on the enemy. Just decimate him. You know, that's us. 
That's us coming with the Lord. That's who we are. I did send it to Blake because I knew it would bless him. If you guys have seen the movie, that scene just lives in my mind. So Gideon now is eavesdropping on the enemy. God sent him to do it. Verse 12, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. Their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Yeah, okay, the enemy has impressive numbers. That's true. We're outnumbered. Well, let's just get that straight. We are outnumbered. That's how it is. Far more are fighting on the enemy's side than are on the Lord's side. It's always been that way. I mean, it was there when the line was drawn when Moses said, who's on the Lord's side, and just the Levites came over. That's how it is. But it, there's no match, just as Gideon with his 300 were plenty of men to take tens of thousands, just as Jesus and those 12 disciples, the faithful ones that he had trained, they were plenty powerful enough, not just to topple the most powerful empire on the face of the planet, Rome, not just that, conquered the world, amen brought God's message all over the world. We are still out there reaping the harvest from that. Hallelujah. So now he is listening, and yes, they see that in number, the enemy is large and great and strong. It's always that way. But, verse 13, when Gideon had come, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend, and he said, behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent, and he struck it, so that it fell, and it turned it upside down so that it lay flat. And his friend replied, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. Well, what I want to note from that is the enemy knew. The enemy knew who Gideon was. I mean, here is the great, in, in literature, they call this dramatic irony. It's when the audience knows something, but the characters don't. It's a good device. It works in stories. It's true. It's true here. Everybody knew. God knew. God called Gideon who he was. Satan knew. He knew. The enemy camp knew. Now let's relate it to us. You think that Satan knows who we are? Why do you think he brings the attacks that he does? Yeah, he knows who you are. He knows. He also knows, just like they knew, he is defeated. What he said right there, that's right. He knows. He knows. Look, what the demons shrieked when Jesus showed up and they said, have you come to torment us before the time? They know they're doomed. They know it. Satan knows his time is short. He knows it. He also knows that when we walk in, oh, that's all for him. Not because of who we are. You point to all kinds of stuff, how weak we are in the flesh. Sure. Yeah, all that's true. How powerful the enemy is in the flesh, that is also true. And it doesn't matter at all. Never has. Never will. He is really defeated. And we do spell trouble for him. He knows it. Now, his only hope is somehow to try to occlude our understanding, to keep us from understanding who we really are. That's all. If he can do that, then maybe he can buy a little time to do a little more harm. That's what he's after. Or maybe he can prevent just one. Maybe just keep one from overcoming, entering the kingdom of God. You know, that's his program. He hates God. He hates us for the same reason, because we're precious to God, because we have what he wanted. The position that God has given us is the position that Satan wanted. We will rule and reign with him. We are made in his image and likeness. He hates us with a violent, complete, and perfect hatred. He wants nothing more than to utterly destroy us. If he can't do that, he wants to torment us and cause us to be ineffectual. I want to just bring this up. I generally don't talk about names and words and all of their meanings and that kind of thing, but I really like this. Get this. Gideon was named a long time before this moment happened. It was an appointment. God had made it. He knew it was coming. His name is Gideon, and it means technically hewer. But what hewer means is one who fells, or you might say conqueror. God knew who he was. He was wearing that name the whole time. We do too. I mean, we are Christians. We're told in Romans chapter 8, we are overwhelming conquerors. And since time is growing short, I'll simply refer to it. You might want to write it down. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. 
It speak to, speaks to us about our weapons, the weapons of our warfare. Look, they're powerful. Immediately when I read that, you know what I think of? I think about Big Daddy's vision. I think about when he looked at the fortresses, those strongholds of the enemy, how strong and unassailable they looked. Oh, they had big metal frameworks that, with rivets throughout. It just looked towering, insurmountable, impregnable. And yet, I mean, what he saw, it wasn't, it wasn't even a big, like I would want to think, like a sledgehammer. It wasn't like that. Maybe more like a tinkerer's hammer, you know, something you might use on a watch, you know. It's not about that. Just tap. And it turns out that the whole thing really is so fragile, it just collapses like the walls of Jericho, like the kingdoms of this world will. And we are that hammer. We're the instrument. That's who we are. The weapons we've been given, well, Satan can't stand against them. He can't. There's no power to do it. You know, it's, it's really not about who we are in the flesh. And we are bringing down, they are vain imaginations. Every, look, every tool that Satan uses, it's all smoke and mirrors. He puts just enough reality, physical reality, fleshly reality in there so that we might buy it. It's like a good lure. It looks lifelike enough that a fish will strike it. It's not real. It's not. And none of those lies that he tries to intimidate us with, they're not real either. Never were. There's no substance in them um, unless we buy them and then they're effective. But they can all be felled with the word even as what God told Gideon over and over again. All of those words were right. Gideon, go in your might. Gideon, you're a valiant warrior. Gideon, I have delivered them over to your hands. You know, those words are true. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, that talks about putting on the armor of God. It tells us it's a command. I mean, there are action words in there, put on. That's active. We actively do it as an act of the will, you know, by faith. We put those things on. And look, it makes us terrifying to the enemy. Because we won't be defeated, not clothed in Christ, not bearing the sword of the word of the ever-living God, which has never been broken, never, always, always comes true. does not return to him empty. It always does exactly what he says. Because there's no power that can stand against him. Nothing's going to thwart his will. Also, we're commanded, be strong. Be strong. Be it. Do that. In the Lord. That's where we're strong. It doesn't matter. I mean, look, if we limp into the Lord, if we crawl into the Lord, we might be weak, you know, before we turn to him, but we're mighty. Mighty is Gideon. Mighty is David. Mighty is all of those. I mean, if you think of uh, Deborah or any one of them, just think of any of them. We're that strong. We can shut the mouths of lions, you know. We can put whole armies to flight. Because we're strong in the Lord. And I'll just leave you with the parting thought because this is what God says about us in Romans 8, 37, just referring to it. We are told, even in the midst of what the world would consider defeats, even if, and it's going to happen, God allows the enemy to wear down the saints. He said that's going to happen. We have already been told that is a victory. That is a victory. Every time Satan does it, he is hastening his own demise. It is a victory. And the glory of that goes on and on. So if any of you are looking for titles, I was toying with this one. What the enemy knows and hopes you don't. Look, the enemy knows who you are. God knows who you are. If we know who we are, everything is possible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.